Time and Harvest with Apostle Lyndon B. Hutcherson. We pray that you will be blessed by this week's message. We're going to be starting a series on ministry mobilization. Ministry mobilization. And it's very important that we get this message in because there are many times that we're dealing with uh, manipulation when it comes to the things of God and church and ministry, and many people have been turned off because people are trying to use people as tools in order to get personal gain and things of that nature. So we're going to be talking today about mobilization or manipulation. We're going to be able to discern between the two today so we can get a correct understanding about it. And we're going to be going through these over the next several weeks as the Holy Spirit would allow us to do so. So I pray that you will tune in every Tuesday at 6 p.m. or be sure to go in and check out the archive. I want to provide these as an additional training tool for those who want to be active in the work of ministry. So as we go through these lessons, I pray that you will be inspired. I also try to keep the chat room open for those who are online. If you have questions or comments or messages you would like to leave, I will try to check that periodically as well. So if you tuned in, if you know someone who's who's involved with ministry, those who are looking to get involved with ministry, we're not talking specifically or particularly to those who are, quote, unquote, licensed and ordained ministry, those who can be lay ministers or just a common believer. We're all called to be active in the work of the kingdom of God. And so this week's lesson is going to teach us and talk to us a little bit about that. So let's get a word of prayer in before we get into some of the the message for mobilization or manipulation today. Praise God. Father God, we thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, Father, we ask that you would send a fire upon each listener right now, that you will breathe new life upon them right now. Stir up their spirits, oh God. Stir up their mind and their heart. Father, is there anything in their lives that is inconsistent with the wholeness, the peace, and the fullness that you declare over them? I come in, I come against it right now in the name of Jesus. We bind up the hand of the enemy as it tries to manipulate or work against any believers right now in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you that the fire of the Holy Spirit and the blood of Jesus is over them right now. I thank you that they'll be inspired, impacted, and motivated to serve God in the fullness of his spirit. I pray right now that any types of spirit of timidity or fear will be loosed from them right now. Father, we thank you that boldness is coming into their life, that a freshness is coming upon them. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray and I decree and declare it has done so right now. Any forces of darkness that are against them, we rebuke you in Jesus' name. Be victorious, saints, right now, right now. Hallelujah, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Thanks we're going to be talking to you today in our midweek Seed Time and Harvest broadcast about mobilization or manipulation. Now, if anyone's familiar with the ministry that God has given us to do, we're very much active in equipping every member for the ministry that God has called them to do. We're not just talking about every member of our particular church, our Bible college, our ministerial fellowship, but every member of the body of Christ that's worldwide, no matter where you are. If you're a believer in Christ, you're called to be mobilized and active in doing the things of God. So understand that as we go forward, but even even though that is the case, uh, definitely it's challenging us to motivate those who are a part of the work that God has assigned for me that we want to push them out of the nest, so to speak. We're not trying to develop people to sit. We're trying to develop people to serve. So I pray that all ministers of the gospel would have that same motivation and that same desire to see people grow and to walk in the fullness of what they're called to do in Jesus' name. So here's some of the objectives. I pray that you have a paper, pencil, and Bible. I'll give you several scripture references as well for you to take notes because this is used to equip. This is not used to just inform this broadcast, this teaching, this training. is used to equip you for whatever purposes that God has for you. So upon completion of this tonight's teaching, uh, we're going to be able to look at some of the key verses that you should memorize, and I'll give those to you as we go along through the lesson. 
but I want you to be able to know that we're going to define manipulation, we're going to define mobilize, and we're going to be able to explain the difference between spiritual mobilization and spiritual manipulation. We're also going to speak to you about explaining the difference between a passive and a mobilized believer, and then we're going to summarize the relationship between mobilization and evangelism. Now, here's a key verse that we're going to use as an outline for some of the lessons for tonight. is Matthew chapter 20, verse 26, and it reads as such. But Jesus called unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, but they are great, must have authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister or your servant. That's our key verse that we're going to talk about tonight. So as we think about that statement from Matthew chapter 20, verse 26, from the words from Jesus Christ, our Lord, King, and our Master. See, it has been said by some that the successful expansion of any movement is in direct proportion to its ability to mobilize and involve its total membership in constant propagation of its beliefs, purposes, and philosophy. You see, children of God, if a goal is to be achieved and a vision fulfilled, you must take action. I want to emphasize that you must take action. You see, if you work only within plans and programs, you will have an organization. But if you mobilize people, you have an organism. And each person in the organism becomes a part of the achievement of the vision. That is why when we talk about Christ Universal Church, we talk about it as an organism of living believers, that each person has a role to fulfill within the body of Christ. We want this to spur our members, and I pray that this spur all of you who are listening to the sound of my voice today, to what we call outward mobilization. But see, you can only get outward mobilization as a result of inward mobilization. Understand it like those children of God. Everyone is motivated to do something. But an important key in effective ministry is to motivate and mobilize God's people for the work of the ministry. We get that example from Ephesians chapter 4 where Paul talked about the gifts that God has, Christ has given to the church. Unfortunately, in many instances when people gather groups of people, they also have a motivation for gathering people, and it's not always for the purpose of promoting the kingdom of God. A lot of times it's, it's for self-promotion. And when people gather people, even if they do it in the name of God, or Jesus, or the Holy Spirit, or the kingdom, however the words they use, it's not the words they use, it's the reason that they're doing it. When people are not sincere in what the true purpose for gathering and connecting and teaching and, and, and encouraging you is, that is called manipulation. See, this is a worldly strategy of mobilization. It centers on manipulating people for the purpose of selfish gain. Understand, children of God, we want to, us to be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. Paul also said in another text, I would not have you ignorant of Satan's devices. So we want to use this teaching tonight in order to not only inform, but to equip and empower you for the work that God has for you to do. Understand something about manipulators. Someone said to me, manipulators. To manipulate means to skillfully manage, direct, or control a person to achieve selfish purposes. Again, to manipulate means to skillfully manage, direct, or control a person to achieve selfish purposes. See, a manipulator exploits and uses other things to achieve an end. In manipulation, the attempts to mobilize people are centered on things that appeal to the flesh. This is how you can tell the difference. See, manipulators, they know that a person is convinced that certain actions will meet his own selfish needs, goals, and desires. And they use your needs, they use your goals, they'll use your desires 
in order to meet their own needs. See, the person who's a manipulator thrives on praise and attention from others. He or she strives for status and a sense of belonging. And often financial or material gain is often involved. See, these are some of the inward motivations which mobilize a manipulator to action. We must be able to discern who's, who is what. Are people manipulators or are they mobilizers? And if they are mobilizing you, are they manipulating you in order to get something for their own personal gain back? Because we have to understand, again, as we talk about the word manipulation, it is solely based on needs. See, manipulation is need-based. And when a person is a manipulator, and you can, from this week's lesson, you'll be able to easily to identify those who are manipulators because the leader sees a need in people. That's why a lot of if we got a particular type of women's ministry or financial ministry, they're ministering to women basically based on their need for security and peace because they have been in abusive relationships. So they know there's a need for that emotional comfort, so they provide that emotion. If someone has been poor and fin- financially strapped, then those who have financial-based ministries will be manipulating you based on your need for finances. Understand that, children of God. So a manipulator sees a need and manipulates people and resources to meet that need. Now, if you are need-motivated, you will soon become need-controlled by these types of ministries. See, people control and manipulate people to meet their own personal needs. We must understand whether we are mobilizing or manipulating people. Now, basically... There are two types of manipulation. One is what I call the push manipulation. This uses fear as its force, children of God. Now, the opposite of the push manipulation is one called the pull manipulation, which uses fleshly incentives and rewards. See, when believers have to be pushed or pulled into involvement in the work of the kingdom of God, It is obviously something wrong with that picture. We should all have a desire to want to do the work of God, whether we get something back in return or not. No one should have to push or pull us to that. But if you are a need-based person, you're going to do something in order to get a need met. And in manipulation, people are often treated with partiality. And sometimes, children of God, listen... Leaders resort to threatening, guilt, and force to get things done. But let's see what the biblical mandate for us is. See, the the Bible warns spiritual leaders to forbear, that is, not to use threatening, knowing that your master God, which is also in heaven, neither is he a respecter of persons with him. You'll find an example of that or a reference for that from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 9. Now, in other words, you should relate to those you lead in the same way that God relates to you. Are you listening to me, leaders, those who want to be leaders, those who desire to lead ministries, pastor churches, teach and evangelize? You should relate to those you lead in the same way God relates to you. Now, I'm going to throw this term called witchcraft out here right now, and it's listed in the book of Galatians, chapter 5, verse 20. It is listed by Paul to the church in Galatia as one of the works of the flesh. Now, in this passage, witchcraft not only refers to the evil work done by witches, all of Satan, it also refers to fleshly manipulation of other people for our own purposes and desires. Today we're talking mobilization or manipulation. We want to talk about this because it's so vital today in the body of Christ. People use the name of God, name of Jesus, the name of Christ, the name of the kingdom for all type of manipulative purposes when we need to understand that God wants to mobilize each believer for service and not just to equip one or two specially equipped or anointed people for service. We all have a ministry for God, saints. 
So Jesus taught, and this is what we teach, that believers are not to adopt such worldly methods of conduct and leadership. See, we don't want to use fleshly manipulation of other people for our own purposes and desires. If you are under ministries who are doing that, then you should be able to learn from this week's message of how you need to govern yourself. If you are a person who is manipulating people, then you also should, through this message, begin to understand by the conviction of the Holy Spirit what you need to do to govern yourself accordingly. So we talk about manipulation. We talk about it using people to get something for personal gain. And a lot of times you dress it up with all purpose. You dress it up in the name of Jesus. You use the name of the Lord. You can use the name of the kingdom. So it's, it's very crafty. But manipulators are people who are trying to hide their true motivation. So they're always going to try to disguise it. The scripture says like this, that the angels would, the demons would transform themselves into angels of light. But now let's look at the difference of manipulation. So that when you see someone who's manipulating, you look at the end result and find out who's really benefiting from the gathering, who's benefiting from, quote, unquote, the 3,000 members, who's benefiting from the tithe. Uh, is it the minister or is it the ministry? Is it just the, that particular ministry or are, is the kingdom of God being advanced or expanded into other areas? That is, are souls being won? Are people coming to know Christ? Are families being healed? Are bodies being healed? Okay, so we need to know what is the end result that we look for in order to determine whether it's being successful or not. Now, the opposite of what we're talking about as far as manipulation is what we call mobilization. We really focus on this as a real mandate for our ministry. In fact, we we have a goal, desire to mobilize at least 3,500 ministers uh, across the southeast region of the U.S. and other regions as the Holy Spirit will direct us, but not for the purpose of building this ministry, but for the purpose of establishing and expanding the kingdom of God. And so there we have ministers who have graduated from our Bible college programs who are a part of the Ambassadors Ministerial Fellowship and all of you ambassadors. I'm speaking to you today to, to remind you of the purpose that we all come together, and that is to to establish and expand the kingdom of God. It is not for you to support the fellowship so that I can establish and expand, but so that we, by the power of the Holy Spirit, can expand and establish the kingdom of God. And so we want to equip, impart, and empower each one of you for your particular ministry service in your local community, first in your home, then in your local community, in your state, region, or nation, or other nations, as God has called you to do. So let's understand something more about mobilization today. See, we need to know, saints of God, that believers are not to be manipulated or become manipulators. Say with me, we are not to be manipulated or to become manipulators, but we certainly are to be mobilized. You see, God has always moved through people who were motivated to action. Throughout the biblical record, we'll see that he called people to mobilize physical, spiritual, and financial resources to accomplish his plans and his purposes. You see, to mobilize means to, means to put in a state of readiness for active service. It means to use one's energies for action. In broad terms, mobilization refers to any event by which God's people are awakened and kept moving and growing until they find their place of strategic involvement in the task of completing world evangelization. Hallelujah, somebody right there. We need to understand our purposes. We need to understand our motivation. We need to understand the call and the direction and the directive of God if we're going to be successful at accomplishing the plan of God. So things is so very vital and important that we know exactly what we're supposed to be about doing and know the motivation or the reasons that we're doing it so that we won't become manipulated or become manipulators. So the opposite of manipulation is to, mo to, to mobilize for physical, spiritual, and resources for God purposes and plans. To mobilize also, we said that it means to be ready for service, to use your energy, your time,
talents for the service of God. See, we have to understand the difference between what the world calls mobilization and what the church should call spiritual mobilization. The difference from manipulation is grounded in the biblical principle. And the motivation that we need to know for spiritual mobilization is focused on God rather than on man. It's not about that famous preacher. It's not about the famous evangelist. It's not going to see the famous healer. It is, a, it is about mobilizing to see God move in the midst of this world. It is not focused on the flesh and self. It is not need-oriented ministry, but command-oriented ministry. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means in just a little while. Now, here's one example. When Jesus visited the pool of Bethesda, there were many people there who were lame, sick, and diseased. But Jesus only healed one man. You see, he was command-oriented rather than need-oriented. See, now this did not mean that he did not have compassion on the others. But he had been led by God to minister to this one man. Understand, children of God and ministers and students and fellowship members and church members, that if you become a need-oriented in ministry, you will soon be overwhelmed by the many needs of people around you. Eventually, you will become need-controlled. You see, the needs of the people will control your life and your ministry. You will be manipulated by them and you become a manipulator in order to meet the great demands of their needs. And this is the situation with many local churches and congregations today, that they are basically, the leaders are doing whatever it, it takes to meet the needs of the people because the people are being manipulated to meet their own personal needs. Come on, somebody, wake up with me here. But we want to understand today, are we mobilizing people or are we manipulating people? And I, I want to stress with each member of that's connected with this ministry that we are not manipulators and we are not to be manipulated. We are not to be need-oriented. We are to be command-oriented. Because if you are command-oriented rather than need-oriented, your ministry is God-directed instead of man-directed. You will be motivated and mobilized by the power of God rather than the manipulation of men and their needs and desires. So we've got to understand the difference between the passive and the mobilized. Someone say with me, the passive and the mobilized. And I, when I say that, I mean that the opposite of being mobilized is being passive. Now, it is important to know the difference between the two if we are to motivate inactive believers for service today. A passive person, let's talk about that. Let's talk about what a passive person looks like. To be passive means to be unconcerned, inactive, unresponsive, indifferent, unemotional, or unfeeling. Now, here are several common reasons why people are passive. This is, it talks about why they are inactive, indifferent, and not involved in the work of the Lord. Firstly, they are not under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Secondly, they have not grasped the meaning of the Great Commission. Next, they do not know their place in the body of Christ. They have no goals, vision, and direction. They also lack singleness of vision. They see too much to do, and they have no clear vision of their role, so they become discouraged and do not do anything. All right, let's continue the list. These are passive people. They are consumed by the cares and involvements of the world. They are afraid that their willingness to become involved will be taken advantage of by others. They're afraid of being manipulated, in other words. Here's another thing that makes people passive. Authoritarian leadership that does everything, it prevents their involvement. See, this is a personality-based ministry instead of a body ministry involving all members of the work of God. In other words, they, they don't want to just become a member to be inactive. They want to do stuff. But if you have an authoritative leadership, the only thing you can do is come and sit. See, in these types of ministries, the pastor or spiritual leader is doing all the work him or herself. But we are to equip and mobilize the body 
for the work of the ministry, not to invite people to come to observe our ministry. Come on, saints. Hallelujah, somebody. Today we're talking about manipulation or mobilization. We're talking about passive people. Here, this is why some people are inactive. Let's continue this list some more. They live in the past. But the Bible warns, remember Lot's wife, looking back to the good old days or how things were done before, this prevents action in the present for people. Another thing about passive people, they are walking in the flesh. You see, when a person walks in the flesh, they cannot accomplish spiritual goals. The flesh prevents you from doing that which you would do according to Romans chapter 7, verse 15. See, frustration, division, and unresolved conflicts are all signs that a person is walking in the flesh. See, these and similar behaviors will render people inactive in the kingdom of God. Here's another thing that makes people passive. Sin, S-I-N, sin, it prohibits the flow of God's anointing. It, it prohibits his fire, his glory, and his revival. Since these are the mobilizing spiritual forces, a believer who continues in sin will soon lose his or her motivation. Discouragement is another thing that causes passivity. A discouraged person is closed-minded, has a need for power, control, and to get his or her own way. They avoid personal responsibility. They blame others for problems, and they want to retaliate. These types of people are unstable and disloyal. And we'll learn more about that later on as we go through the lesson about how discouragement causes passivity. And, and a final thing that can cause people to become Passive is a professional attitude. You see, they think that everybody has to be a polished speaker. Everybody has to be so skilled and anointed in singing and all this. So they're comparing themselves to other people who seem to be so prim, proper, so professional that they say, I can never measure up to their standard, so I'll just do nothing. See, this is a problem that often renders people inactive in the modern church age. This professional attitude is one that says, let's just hire somebody who's qualified to do it, not necessarily who are called by God to do it. So when we have passive people, behaviors, inside of one person, then that's going to make the group of people that you're around passive because birds of the same feather always seem to flock together, saints of God. So we want all of our members, students, and, and those who are listening to the sound of my voice today to know that God has a special purpose for you to do, and God didn't call any of us to be inactive. He called all of us into service. And if you're not under a ministry that's teaching you and equipping you for your works of service, then you need to find someone that can teach and equip you to bring you to maturity. We have many materials available online by correspondents or in the classrooms at our network training centers that we're establishing across the region. So feel free to contact us, and we can try to get some information and resources into your hand. It's time for the body of Christ to, to awaken. It's time to awaken that sleeping giant and stop allowing the, the kingdoms of this world to subdue the kingdoms of God. So if we become a passive person, if we join groups with other passive persons, the group becomes a passive people or a passive congregation. So let's understand a little bit more about that. So when passive individuals join together in a corporately or as a church family, basically the passive church fits the description of the church in Sardis that talked about it in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 1. It said this, that they have a name, that they live, but they are dead. So here's a checklist for a passive church, a passive local body of believers. And, we, and I want you to ask yourself, if you're a member of a congregation, how does your church measure up to this list? Here's the first thing. The physical care of the church facilities is below average, and it conveys an I don't care attitude. Secondly, there's a heavy dependence on the pastor or paid staff to do the work of ministry. There is a strong orientation to the past, believing that the good old days were better than the present time. 
There is declining membership. There are many inactive members. The focus is on music, children, and youth while the adults remain inactive. Here's something else about a passive church. Economy is more important in decision-making than steps of faith. Communication is poor between members, pastor, and staff. A lack of attendance reveals a low level of concern. There is no evangelical fervor. Policymakers and aggressive members are largely from the people who were members when the congregation started or from the good old days. They got the clicks and everything going on. Let's continue this list of a passive church. The minister views his ministry as in the past rather than in the future. The scripture says that where there's no vision, the people perish. Next thing on this list of passive churches is that the congregation is convinced that if they can find a super pastor to replace their minister, their problems will be over. Next, the governing body of the congregation, whether that's the board, council, or et cetera, tends to see its primary role as a permission withholding body to say what can't be done. See, in an active church or a mobilizing church, the governing body encourages creativity, innovation, steps of faith, and whatever at all possible. It gives rather than withholds permission because, remember, we're command-oriented, not need-oriented. And the command comes from God. Let's continue the list with a few more things to understand something about a passive church. New plans are met with arguments of why that will not work here. The emphasis is on learning rather than doing. Many ministers gather people, and I see people with their notebooks taking notes, and they've studied, they've studied, they've studied. They've gone to conference after conference, seminar, seminar, and they know what they do next year if they go to another conference, they go to another seminar, but in between the conference and seminars, they do nothing. Okay? Also in a passive church, the typical member cannot call more than five people in the congregation by name. The people are unusually critical of what is and in what is not happening. And new members find it hard to gain a sense of belonging and to feel needed. See, all of these things that are just listed are signs of a passive church, and passive ch- churches become passive because they have passive people in them. All of these items exhibit unconcern, indifference and a lack of involvement. Today we're talking about manipulation or mobilization. So we've gotten a pretty good picture of what it is to be a passive person and how that leads to passive congregations or passive churches. We know from the mandate of God that we're all called to be active in the work of ministry. So let's look at a mobilized person as opposed to the passive person. A mobilized person is readily adaptable and responsive to the direction of the Holy Spirit. He is not set on his or her selfish ways. He or she is prepared his spiritual vessel or wineskin to receive the new wine, the, the new things God is doing. It may not have been something that has been done before by, by other in ministry, but you're being led by God, not led by man. A mobilized person is God-dependent rather than self-dependent. He or she is spiritually rather than fleshly motivated. He He or she is excited about the work of God and involved in the kingdom of God. A mobilized person as opposed to a passive person is willing to act, even take risk of faith, and to take responsibility for that action. A mobilized person is stable, loyal, and instead of revenge in times of crisis, they seek a solution. They are command-oriented rather than need-oriented. They do not manipulate or exploit others. They are compassionate, loving, and involved in and excited about the work of the kingdom. Does that describe you and your relationship with your church congregation, saints of God? If it doesn't, it may explain why your ministry or your church is not mobilized for service because the people in your congregation 
has to be individually motivated for the service of God and can't just sit back expecting somebody else to do it. So let's listen to what happens when mobilized people gather as opposed to when passive people gather. I pray that some of you are getting those saints of God because when we do the training and equipping through the Bible College and as those members of the Ambassador's Ministerial Fellowship are licensed and ordained for the work of ministry, we're licensing and ordaining you, equipping you for works of service for you to build the body of Christ, to come to maturity, to you all reach the full measure of God so we can fulfill the great commission of God to go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. That is a mobilizing type of people that we need to be about doing. This is not about developing a group of people that just meet for social events on Sunday. Yet we gather for worship, for the glory is due God's name. But we enter to worship, but when we depart our places of worship, we depart to serve. That is, we leave there mobilized, on fire for God, looking for the glory of God to manifest. This is how it was in the early church, and this is how it still should be today, saints of God. We must become a mobilized people, not a manipulated people, but a mobilized people. So if we review the signs of a passive church that we talked about earlier, think about the opposite of each of those signs that I gave you. See, the opposite of each of those behaviors of a passive church describes a mobilized and motivated church. A mobilized church is spiritually renewed, saints of God. A mobilized church is motivated. It is set on fire with love and passion for the laws. It is composed of a group of people actively involved in the fulfillment of the Great Commission. It is a kingdom rather than a denominational mentality. It is a worshiping, revived church filled with the demonstrations of the power and the glory of God. Does that describe you and your relationship with your local congregation saints? If not, Maybe you need to govern yourself accordingly. Now, let's look at some of the qualities of a mobilizer. We talked about some of the things of a manipulator, that they do it for selfish reasons, for personal reasons. If you're part of a ministry that talks about financial prosperity and you're still poor after being there for 20 years and the pastor is prospering, then he's manipulating you for his, his or her own prosperity. Okay, wake up, saying, What have they mobilized and inspired you to do? And so we want to be able to tell the difference as we train and equip you through not only with your mind, we want to equip your heart, and we want God to equip your spirit to be efficient but be effective in life and in service to God. So here are some of the qualities of a mobilizer. Say with me, mobilizer. See, now there was once a famous scientist named Sir Isaac Newton. He studied and recorded the natural law of motion. And the first law of motion that he stated was that a body in motion tends to remain in motion, and a body at rest tends to remain at rest. Now, this is true spiritually also. People will remain indifferent, unconcerned, and inactive unless motivated and mobilized for the work of the kingdom of God. This is where the ministry of a mobilizer comes in. A mobilizer is one who mobilizes others, but in order to do this, he or she must first be mobilized himself. Understand that a mobilized person then mobilizes others by example and encouragement rather than force and fear. A mobilizer is committed to the specific task of the Great Commission. Notice what the key motivation, the goal that we're trying to reach is the Great Commission. They concentrate on concerns outside of themselves and, and, and their own personal and selfish needs. They are not an organizational person. They are not a denominational person. They are kingdom people. Their purposes, their goals and objectives focus not on self, not on their church, not on their ministry, but it focus on the kingdom of God. Today we're talking about mobilization or manipulation. And we're talking about a mobilizer now. We talked about a manipulator earlier in some of this week's lesson about global ministry mobilization. Let's understand a little bit more about a mobilizer, children of God. 
A mobilizer equips others for the work of ministry by challenging them. Are you being challenged for ministry service as you go forward when you go to your local congregation for worship or Wednesday night teaching, Tuesday night teaching, or whatever type of teaching or training they're giving you? When you leave there, do you feel imparted, impacted, and empowered to do the ministry work yourself? Or are you just, wow, I took another set of notes this week, and I look forward to going back next week to get another set of notes? Children of God, that should not be your experience if you are being mobilized for the service in the kingdom of God. You see, a mobilizer equips others for the work of ministry by challenging them with spiritual vision, grounding them in the foundations of faith, and challenging them to spiritual reproduction, that is, that you'll go forward and make disciples as you become a disciple. You'll go forward and mobilize others as you yourself are mobilized. You will be fruitful and you will multiply. See, a, a mobilizer equips people to discover and release their potential without feeling threatened by their spiritual growth and advancement in the kingdom of God. Actually, the spiritual leaders which God sets in the church as apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, are all to be mobilizers. Their purpose is to equip others for the work of the ministry. The mobilizer never views people as inanimate objects to be used to get something done. They know that mobilization involves more than saying, do this, and having a person do it. Mobilizers recognize that other people are created in the image of God and not things to be used even in the work of the kingdom. Thanks to God, I pray that you'll begin to understand the difference between manipulation and mobilization. And if you find yourself on the opposite end of being mobilized or a mobilizer, I pray today that the power of the Holy Spirit will bring conviction upon you. And as you continue to learn and study and grow, and as God gives you opportunities to lead or to be led, make sure you're being led by a mobilizer and not by a manipulator. And when you get in, in the position of being a leader, make sure that you are not a manipulator but a mobilizer. So understand, saints, a mobilizer is courageous in the face of opposition and has a deep spiritual experience. Their life has been touched by God's power and by his glory. You must learn to walk in integrity and maintain a close personal relationship with the Lord. If we look at Joshua in the Old Testament, Joshua, the man chosen by God to mobilize Israel to, to take the promised land, so he mobilized Joshua. And Joshua mobilized Israel to take the promised land. This is one of the best examples in the Old Testament. Now, we'll study more about that later on as we go through this week's mess, maybe next week in the upcoming week. So I want you to tune in and continue to stay in touch with me as we go through these lessons. And also contact me by email or through the website or by phone. And I'll try to get some of the week's lessons that we'll be studying each week to you so that you can be prepared to uh, examine them and give questions and make comments about them as well. Remember, this is not just a teaching that I'm putting out that sounds right. This is something that I implement in my daily life and my daily ministry to others. See, we really take the business of equipping people for the works of service serious here at Amazing Grace Ministries. And I want all those who are enrolled in the Bible college and seminary programs and all the members of Christ Universal Church, the cell churches that's meeting in various places, as well as the members of the ministerial fellowship understand that I, I as well submit myself to the same authority that I ask you to submit yourself to, which is the power of the Holy Spirit that's given to us through Jesus Christ. So many believers are spiritually dead because they have dead men and women preaching and leading them. Jesus said like this, the blind are leading the blind and both are falling into the ditch. When you have a blind or spiritually dead leader leading you, you, you will become inactive. You will be passionless. You will be indifferent and unconcerned. See, if you, if you lack a burning heart, those you lead will lack it as well. And if you are having somebody else lead you, you probably lack that heart because the person who's leading you likes that heart. Saints, we want to avoid having a passionless religion. 
because a passionless religion will not put out the fires of the enemy that is raging across our world today. The best way to fight fire, saints, is with fire. See, Elijah learned that the wood is not enough. The altar is not enough. Even our sacrifices are not enough. We must be touched by the fire of God. If you look in Numbers chapter 16, verses 46 to 48, it records how Aaron was used by God to stand between the living and the dead, providing a bridge of life. This is what a mobilized person does. He or she stands between the dead or the passive and the living or the active. They are used of God to mobilize believers to action. They carry the sense of filled with the fire of God, igniting each life he touches with the flame. See, many people are trying to lead God's people and do God's work with hearts that have never been truly set on fire or with hearts that have lost their fire. Can the fire that set the desert bush ablaze in the time of Moses set our hearts on fire with the burning of God today? Oh, can the fire that Ezekiel saw depart from stage to stage return to us today? Oh, we pray it can. Today we're talking about mobilization or manipulation. Now for the final section for this week's lesson, let's talk about mobilization and evangelism. Because there would not be effective evangelization without effective mobilization. So for what purpose are we mobilizing people? Are we gathering and mobilizing people to build a new church building? to raise funds for a church trip? Or are we mobilizing people to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all things that he has commanded us and bringing all things to their remembrance? You see, saints, why should we try to motivate a passive people? If people are comfortable in our congregations, and their needs are being met, then why stir them up, right? Well, let me tell you, children of God, we must be concerned with mobilizing spiritual resources because it is the only way that the great spiritual harvest of our world can ever be reaped. We are mobilizing spiritual resources for the purpose of evangelism. We need to understand that there is a difference between mobilization and other approaches to evangelism. See, in most evangelistic programs, the center of attention is the gifted or sometimes in the modern church, the professional evangelist. In this type of evangelism, the focus is on increasing the number of listeners. See, they use advertising, invitations, radio, and television interviews, and many other means. See, everything possible is done to broaden the impact of the evangelist ministry. Now, nothing is wrong with these methods, but it is important that we take full advantage of the gifts that people call evangelists, which God has said in the church. Yes, but to meet the challenge of the great end-time spiritual harvest that is upon us, we must assume a mobilized approach to evangelism, not an individualized approach. See, a mobilized approach to evangelism focuses on all believers, not on one particular believer. It seeks to multiply the number of converts by motivating each one of God's people to do the work of an evangelist. And you can read about that in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5. It is this type of mobilization that is done within the biblical framework of the church. It is called body ministry where each person assumes his position based upon his spiritual gift. Then the whole body functions in unity to achieve global objectives in harmony with that of the Great Commission. See, in mobilization for evangelism, we use every legitimate means available to reach every level of society, presenting the whole gospel to all men. This is the time for mobilization, saints, not manipulation. Not manipulation. In, listen, 
even in a natural army, the troops are mobilized in a time of war or great need. Spiritually speaking, this is a time of warfare. We are in the greatest battle ever for the hearts, souls, and minds of men and women across the world. This is a time of great need, children of God. We see it as we look at the spiritual harvest fields of the world, ready to be reaped, but with few laborers working fervently in the setting sun. Now is the time for mobilization of God's people. As the prophet Micah said, mobilize. The enemy lays siege. Read about that in the book of Micah, chapter 5, verse 1. But in order for us to do this, in order for us to mobilize, we must return to God-commanded rather than need-oriented ministry. We must rely on God rather than self. You see, organization, cooperation, multiplying doctrine, all of these are important. But only God can send the fire, the glory, and the revival that mobilizes his people. As a body without breath and life, so is a people of God who are organized, united, and doctrinally grounded, but yet lacking the breath of life of the Holy Spirit. See, if you rely on your education, you will accomplish what education can do. If you rely on your own skills and hard work, you will obtain the results of your hard work and skills. But when you rely on committees alone, you can get a lot done, but only what committees are capable of doing. But when you rely on God, you get what God can do. Saints, human effort will never get the job done. The great end-time harvest cannot be reaped by fleshly methods. Paul talked about it to the church in Galatians, says, Ye are ye so foolish, having begun in the spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh or the works of the law. This work of mobilization cannot be accomplished by manipulation or by human might or power. In Zechariah 4 and 6, then he answered and spake unto me, saying, Not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. You see, many years ago, God gave a prophet named Zechariah a vision of a golden lampstand. The lamp furnished light through a bowel that received oil coming from a living olive tree. The lamp burned as long as the oil flowed. Saints of God, you cannot do God's work without the anointing of God continuously being channeled into your life. You must be attached to the living olive tree. As a fruit-bearing branch, you must be grafted into the vine, according to John chapter 15. See, this is divine motivation. This is sovereign mobilization. And Jesus was touched by this mobilizing fire of the Holy Spirit in Luke chapter 4, verse 18. The first church was set on fire by the Pentecost, Holy Spirit, falling in Acts chapter 2. David knew the power of the Spirit in 2 Samuel 23 and 2. Ezekiel testified to it repeatedly in, in Ezra in chapter 7 and verse 6. In Nehemiah 2 and 18, they also felt the motivating, mobilizing forces of God when the hand of the Lord was upon them. And we see that the Apostle Paul knew it as well in Second Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 to 22. And saints, you can know the same fire and glory too. Today we've talked to you about mobilization or manipulation. We are not to be manipulators or manipulated. We are to, not to be passive but active. We are to be mobilized and mobilizers. So I want you to be able to understand the definition for manipulation, saints of God. Understand the definition for mobilize. And I want you to know the difference between spiritual mobilization and manipulation. I want you to be able to know the difference between a passive and a mobilized person. And I want you to be able to know the, the relationship between mobilization and evangelism. Oh, saints of God, if you want further study into this week's lesson, I ask that you or suggest that you read the story about David's army in 1 Samuel chapter 30. 
you see it talks about a description of a discouraged person. See, a discouraged person is closed-minded. They have a need for power and control to get their own way. They avoid personal responsibility. They blame others for problems, and they want to retaliate. They are unstable and disloyal. But what did God do to change David's situation? I want you to realize by reading that, what can God do to encourage you? You see, a man named As Abraham Maslow claimed that in order to motivate people to action, you must appeal to their basic needs, which include the following, to fulfill one's potential, to grow and develop, to be creative, to esteem, for esteem of others, esteem of self, to belong, to love. People provide shelter, safety, sex, thirst, and, and must satisfy their need for hunger. Now, while all these are important to life in this world, they are all fleshly desires. See, people who are motivated on the base of an appeal to these needs will not long remain motivated. See, when their selfish desires and needs are not being met, they will retreat back into inactivity until somebody meets them again. And you cannot mobilize people for spiritual purposes on the basis of fleshly needs. You must mobilize them for spiritual purposes on the basis of spiritual principles. Today, saints, this lesson has been used to talk to you about mobilization or manipulation. Let's understand, saints, that we are the mobilizers. We are the mobilized. We are not to be manipulated or manipulators. We are not the passive. We are the active. So we understand again from Matthew chapter 20, verse 26. But Jesus called unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your servant or be your minister.